We are the paradoxical ape. Bipedal, naked, large-brained. Long the master of fire, tools, and language, but still trying to understand ourselves. Aware that death is inevitable, yet filled with optimism. We grow up slowly. We hand down knowledge. We empathize and deceive. We shape the future from our shared understanding of the past. Carta brings together experts from diverse disciplines to exchange insights on who we are and how we got here. An exploration made possible by the generosity of humans like you. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to be talking about alcohol and alcohol metabolism, nothing that directly relates to different forms of thinking, but from a population genetics point of view. What's the path of ethanol in a human? First, it enters the mouth, and there are genes controlling that. It enters the stomach, and there's a gene that functions to metabolize there. It enters the liver, and there are two genes that function there. And then everywhere in the circulation, the rest of the body, there's aldehyde dehydrogenase and another enzyme SCHAF3, previously ACN9, that I'll talk about later. Everybody remembers the little paper strips that we tested, and some people said, yuck, it's bitter. Other people said, no, there was no taste whatsoever. Well, it turns out that at task 2R38, there is a very common variant, and the form with three amino acid substitutions represented here by red, individuals with that genotype drink much less ethanol than do people without that genotype. Being able to detect bitter substances also apparently makes ethanol seem bitter and unpleasant. Here's the metabolic pathway. Once we get the ethanol into the body, it's metabolized primarily by three enzymes into acid aldehyde and then one primary gene, aldehyde dehydrogenase 2, converting to acetic acid. This other gene seems to be involved in how acetate is used, and we'll talk about that later. The ADH genes exist as a cluster of seven genes on the long arm of chromosome 4, and three of those appear to produce the major enzymes for this first stage of ethanol metabolism. The second stage is ALDH2 on chromosome 12, and together they convert ethanol into acetate. The ADH gene cluster is several genes of which three, the class ones, ADH1A, 
B and C are very similar, but all of the genes are replication of a basic pattern of about 15 KB and nine exons. ADH7 functions in the esophagus and stomach. ADH1B and 1C function in the liver. ADH1A functions in the fetus and not talk about that anymore. ADH4 functions in many tissues. Not much is known about 5 and 6 in terms of ethanol metabolism. Those three clusters of the ADH class 1 evolved as duplications before the separation of primates from other animals and certainly before the old world monkeys. We're not sure how early the duplication occurred, but it seems to be primary a primate-specific duplication. It certainly does not exist in the mouse. There are many amino acid polymorphisms in the ADH gene, and here are several that are listed. And those with stars alter the VMAX and generally favor more rapid conversion of ethanol into acetaldehyde. The most studied variant is the arginine at position 47 to histamine substitution that has a much higher VMAX and has been associated with alcoholism in many, many studies. ALDH2 has an interesting dominant negative variant, a lysine in position 504 of the coding sequence. This prevents dimer formation, and those dimers need to form a tetramere for necessary enzymatic activity. So even in a heterozygote, there is much less activity and there's near zero activity in the homozygotes. So the ADH variants seem to be converting ethanol more rapidly to acetaldehyde and the ALDH2 variant blocking conversion of acetaldehyde. It's in red here because acetaldehyde is a toxin and is believed to be largely responsible for a flushing reaction, a reaction in individuals lacking functional ALDH2 to the presence of ethanol. Here are the gene frequency variants around the world for a promoter region variant that seems to be in East Asian common with the main arginine to 47 to histidine variant, which is an East Asian variant, though it's present in the Middle East and largely absent in Europe and in the Americas and not very common in the Pacific either. At ADH1C, two of the variants, the 272 glutamine and the 349 valine, are both present in most populations, commonly in Europe and commonly in some of the American populations. There's a termination codon present in the Middle East and rarely in Europe, and there's a unique variant 
in the Americas, the proline to threonine, with largely unknown consequences in terms of metabolism. And at ADH4 and ADH7, these graphs simply show there's variation around the world, but it's not as clear a pattern of geography except for the ADH4 variant that's very rare in Africa, very rare in the Americas, and common in much of the rest of the world. And here's simply a graph of the frequency of the arginine to 47 histidine variant, highly frequent in Far East Asia, in a fairly tight region, and common also and separately in Southwest Asia, and very rare to absent in most of the rest of the world. What's interesting is that the evidence is now strong that selection operated separately in those populations in East Asia and separately in those populations in Southwest Asia. That selection must have occurred long after the population separated, probably within the last 20,000 years, and possibly as recent as the Neolithic. The possible selective factor is unknown, though this is strongly associated with resistance to alcoholism. It's hard to see how resistance to addiction to alcohol would be a positive selective force. But how do we look at that evidence of selection? The logic is the relative extended haplotype. If an allele at a locus is selected for positively, it will rise in frequency very quickly, and recombination will not have a chance to randomize other alleles that are on the same chromosome, but increasingly far away. This can be compared here in the upper graph to real data on how frequent the haplotype is and how far the linkage disequilibrium or the relative haplotype homozygosity extends. And you see here in the first paper we did on the selection, here is an East Asian population way above what you would expect for a gene that rose in frequency simply by random genetic drift. Here in the lower panel, simulation studies show that this is well above the 95th percentile and strong evidence for selection having operated. That's made even stronger if one looks at other Far Eastern populations. And so here are the Chinese, the Cantonese Chinese, collected actually in San Francisco, but of clear Chinese origin. Japanese and Koreans from Japan and Korea, and Southeast Asian populations where the frequency is much lower and the evidence for selection much smaller. A sample of Chinese from Taiwan 
also seems to show not such strong evidence, but it's still above the 95th percentile. Here's a different way of graphing. Here's how the relative homozygosity increases as one gets further away from the selected point, i.e. the ADH1B47 his allele in Southwest Asia, Ethiopian Jews, Palestinians, and a sample of Ashkenazi. And clearly, the evidence is very strong for the Ethiopian Jews and for the Palestinians, a little less strong for the Ashkenazi Jews, but still strong that selection seems to have increased the frequency of this variant over what random drift could account for. Moving back to East Asia, this is a complicated graph, but notice simply here the purple is the frequency of the functional variant that's more rapidly metabolizing ethanol, and the population samples are grouped by linguistic family that also corresponded to whether the population was still non-agricultural, a herding or hunter-gatherer population, as opposed to the highest frequency in those groups that adopted an agricultural lifestyle earliest. So the question is, what is common between Southwest Asia and East Asia, where there's evidence that agriculture is involved in East Asia, allele frequency increases, it appears to be something related to the Neolithic transformation of about 10,000 years ago. And that agrees with the fact that these methodologies for detecting selection seem to be powerful only for selection that's occurred within the last 10,000 or somewhat more years ago. So selection is recent and seems to occur primarily in populations that adopted agriculture earliest. If we go back to ALDH2, the dominant negative variant is very common in East Asia, but it doesn't occur in Southwest Asia. Its geographic distribution overlaps with that of the selected ADH1B gene, but it's not identical. And statistical evidence is very indirect. The very large differences in frequency over short geographic distances argues for selection, but it's not a very strong argument. Unfortunately, there is such high linkage disequilibrium throughout this region that we cannot find meaningful differences between those chromosomes with the dominant negative variant and those chromosomes with the regular allele. Could there be interaction? Here we see in one of the regions in which the ADH1B is highly frequent, both occur. The dominant negative ALDH2 occurs 
also in a more northerly pattern, interestingly, at a lower frequency in between these two. The ADH1B variant is not very common in this northern region, as we saw in an earlier slide. And now let me turn to SDHAF3. I'll refer to it also as ACN9 because I don't know what the succinate dehydrogenase complex assembly factor 3 really does. But the original name of this, ACN9, was because it's a homologue of the acetate non-utilizing variants in fungi. So there's a very strong promoter variant, a cis-regulatory element. The ENCODE project gives it a very high ranking for functionality. And there's a SNP right in the middle of that regulatory variant. And here is a study done by Dick et al. back in 2008. And here is that variant. And here is the probability associated with a family-based association study for alcoholism. Highly significant. Other variants in the upstream region are also marginally to significantly significant, but this is quite overwhelming. What does this have to do with ethanol? A separate study by Stranger et al. in 2007 looked at DNA and RNA specifically amounts varying among individuals in an early population genetic study. And they found many of the SNPs they looked at associated with expression variants of what was then called ACN9, especially in the Chinese and Japanese samples. Four of them we were able to study in our lab and look at populations globally. And here you see in the dark red bars that that high expression haplotype is present in East Asia and the Americas and very rare in Europe. Yet that enhancer region that I showed before was a study done in Europeans where this particular high frequency haplotype with high activity does not exist. It's a conundrum. I looked just before giving this talk. There are almost no papers looking at ACN9 recently in humans, and there are only four papers in PubMed looking at the gene under its new name. So clearly there is something that happened in East Asia and Southwest Asia that caused one particular ADH1B allele to become common, but it did it on different haplotypes, the same allele, but an allele that with random genetic drift and separation of the two populations with a long time gap caused to be on different haplotypes.
So the selection was independent. It's not clear how variation that the other ADH genes is involved in possible selection. And why is the ALDH2 null allele so common in East Asia? We don't know. We suspect selection, but we don't see it. And how is SDHAF3 or ACN9 involved in this? It's an acetate non-utilizing. So it either utilizes acetate in, say, the high expression form or blocks its use in other forms. We simply do not know. And there are many questions still to be answered in all of these genes. But clearly, genes and environment are important in thinking about addiction to ethanol. And yet none of this relates to how ethanol affects the function of the brain. And in closing... I want to thank the more than 2,000 individuals who have donated blood samples over the many years we've been studying populations. I want to thank collaborators from around the world who helped collect all the samples that you've seen and some you didn't. And the work that I've summarized was done by many former postdocs and students that have contributed to a growing database. Thank you.